Hi everyone. We're playing a game of hide and go seek with Roberta. Help me find her. Shh. Hold on a second. Aha! There you are, Roberta. We found you. Dr. Z, you just missed it. Were you not paying attention? I've had a mysterious feathered visitor in my habitat the last few mornings, and I am anxious to find out who it is. I keep trying to say hello, but I'm just not fast enough. Hmm. A mysterious visitor. I love a good mystery. You know what, Roberta? We are going to help you with this avian enigma. But first, we've got some business to take care of. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Zulittle from the world-famous San Diego Zoo. You've met my good friend Roberta. You won't believe the stories and adventures we've been on. So let's explore the natural world together. So buckle up, everyone, because we're about to bring the zoo to you. All right, Roberta, I'm ready to go. Oh, Dr. Z, what are you wearing? Well, Roberta, we're about to solve a mystery and I am in disguise. But if the disguise is making you nervous, I can take it off. All right, Roberta, I need you and our friends at home to tell me everything about this bird. I need to know the shape, the size, the beak size, the color, its favorite pizza topping, what television shows it likes to watch, all the good essential stuff. It sounds like our friends noticed quite a few details. It's a rather small bird, mostly black feathers, with a little bit of white on its chest and a little black beak. Perfect, Roberta. I am about to reveal the bird that is visiting you. Here we go. Uh, no. This bird is much smaller than that, Dr. Z. And remember, I mentioned that this bird flies. Ostriches are really fast runners, but they can't fly. Hmm. I will have to think about that, Roberta. It's just so exciting to have a new visitor. I have so many questions. Who is this bird? And what is the reason for the visit? I would love it if we could become friends. All good questions, Roberta. And we need to remain observant, ask questions, and gather all the information we can. I would love to make friends as well, Roberta. Huh. I know how humans make friends and create connections, but I wonder, how do animals create connections amongst themselves? You know what, Roberta? I think I've got it. You are having a fly-in. A fly-in? What in the world is that? Well, I'm going to let Paige from Baton Rouge Zoo explain further. They had a similar situation happen in their facility. She might be able to help us with this avian oddity. So we're here at New Lake at the Baton Rouge Zoo where we have two American white pelicans. Both of our birds are rehab animals, which means that they were injured out in the wild and the rehabbers called to see if we could give them a new home. And every year, a wild pelican joins our flock. The other one is what we consider a fly-in. And all that means is that he doesn't actually live with us all year round. He's not a part of our collection. He just comes and hangs out with us a few months out of the year. He's been coming for the last few years, but in probably the last three, he's started to get a lot more comfortable. So that means instead of spending a month or two at a time here, he's actually gotten to where he'll spend through about the end of October on to about March or April before he goes ahead and, and leaves for the season. Well, American white pelicans are considered to be migratory animals, and migratory is just a fancy term for an animal that spends some of its year in one area and the rest of its year in another, depending upon the availability of food resources. So our fly-in would have spent most of his summer up in the northern United States and Canada and then come down here to join us for the winter where it's a little bit warmer and nicer. We feel that the pelicans decide to spend his winters with us because it's a very safe environment, there's readily available, easy to get food, and other pelicans for him to spend his time with. Our resident pelicans seem to get along quite well with our visitor. They spend a lot of their time together, they attend feedings at the same time, and while he does seem to straggle behind just a little bit, they're all very cooperative with sharing. Our pelicans are fed generally about twice a day, earlier in the morning and then again in the afternoon. We give them about six pounds of silver side fish 
and they know that we're coming because they see a keeper with a big silver bucket and they all three come up, swim up, and we throw them fish one at a time. We do that to make sure that each pelican gets the correct amount of fish and that one's not missing out over the other. And it gives us a really good opportunity to kind of give them a once over, see how they're doing, and make sure that they don't have any health issues that we can easily spot. I do like seeing the fly-in come in every year. Whenever we hear in the morning that he's returned, it's kind of like having an old friend come back. We're not really sure whether or not our pelican will return next year as he has in the past, but if he does, we'll be here. Oh, <laughs> I see. So, my little fly-in visitor might be migratory. And who knows how far the little bird has to travel? Maybe it just wants to spend some time in my habitat to take a rest during its long flight. You know, Roberta, migratory birds, black and white, travels far. I've got it. Your avian friend is a surf scoter. There we go, Roberta. Mystery solved. Uh, no. Dr. Z, this is definitely not a surf scoter. It's still too large, and the bird I keep seeing has a solid black head with just a little bit of white on her belly. Besides, I'm not just interested in knowing what kind of bird he or she is. I just want to be friends. But what can I do to help make my visitor feel more comfortable and welcome in my habitat? Let's ask our friends. What is something you do to make someone feel more welcome? Oh, okay. <gasps> Smile. Nice. Uh, be friendly. Okay. Oh, include them in activities. <gasps> These are all great ideas. Well, you know, Roberta, I think you have to find something in common with your friends. Perhaps you can start off by telling them... Telling them a joke? <gasps> oh, yes. Good idea, Dr. Z. Everyone loves jokes. It's the perfect icebreaker. You know, everyone <laughs> loves jokes, Roberta, but not everyone loves your jokes, Roberta. But you know what, Roberta? You're my friend, and I think let's go with it. Let's hear your joke. Yes! <laughs> Did you hear about the crow and the telephone pole? He wanted to make a long distance car. <laughs> How does a bird with a broken wing manage to land safely? With its sparrow shoot. Why do ducks fly south? Because it's too far to walk. And here's one more from Oliver in San Diego. What do you call an electric parrot? A shockatoo! Those jokes were good, but it was Oliver's jokes that flew far above everyone else's. His joke was awesome. <laughs> I'm going to tweet that. Yeah. You know, Roberta, it's not just jokes that are going to make a connection. Jeff the Nature Guy from Zoo Montana tells the story of two friends where one friend helped another friend get comfortable in a new habitat. Let's watch. Hey guys, I'm Jeff the Nature Guy at Zoo Montana, and today we're going to talk about best friends. Best friends, like me and you. That's even though we're besties, I'm talking about grizzly bears, like the ones you work with every day. So today we're going to talk about best friends and two of the best friends we have here at Zoo Montana are Ozzy and Bruno. And Ozzy came to us after being a trouble bear in Yellowstone. He's almost like a real life Yogi the Bear. He was getting into trash cans, causing problems at campsites, and came to us not looking so good. And after he came to the zoo, our whole job was to acclimate him to living here at Zoo Montana. But the problem was, is he was pretty scared of noises. Trucks, airplanes, things that might scare you at night scared Ozzy the same way you might get scared when you're going to sleep. So here's the thing, is we decided to give him a best friend. Because when things are going bad, there's nothing like a friend to make you feel better. <laughs> so 
So we introduced him to Bruno, our big bear. He's a big boy, about 700 pounds. And when the introduction first happened, you can imagine things didn't start off so good. Bruno jumped on top of him, sat on him for two hours, and let him know, hey, I'm the boss. But guess what? Even though I'm the boss, I'm gonna be your friend. And the two have been best buds ever since. You can watch him wrestle, you can watch him play, and the best thing is, it's helped Ozzy out. There's nothing like a best friend to make you feel better when you're scared at a new location, and Ozzy is a prime example. a big brother or a big sister or even a little brother or little sister, you know sometimes you need each other and these two are no different. Nothing like a good friend to make you feel better when you're feeling down and out. You know Roberta, friendships sometimes just take time and just being there for a friend does more for the relationship than you might know. Okay, so I might hold off on jokes for the moment and give my little feathered friend a bit more time. I'm sure I have what it takes to make our visitor feel more comfortable. And then maybe we can be friends. Oh, Dr. Z, did you hear that? That was a bird. Listen. I heard it, Roberta, and I know exactly what that is. Roberta, your friend is a black Phoebe. A black Phoebe? I don't think I've ever heard of that bird before. Can you quickly check your field guide and show me a picture, Dr. Z? Of course, Roberta. Let me check and show you and our friends at home. This here is the Black Phoebe. Oh, yes, yes, that's the one. Oh, it's so nice to finally put a name to the face. Thank you, Dr. Z. Oh, but hang on a sec. I just realized at Baton Rouge Zoo, the pelicans were the same species. And so were the grizzly buddies at Zoo Montana. Do you think we will still be able to be friends, even if we're different species and don't communicate the same way? Of course, Roberta. Best friends can be from different species. My BFFs aren't humans, they aren't zebras, but I have been friends with them for years and I'm going to introduce them to you right now. It's all about you. I wanted to introduce you to my best friends forever, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And I've got three boys with me over here. You could tell they're boys because they've got horns on their back. Those are the boys. The girls don't have any horns. They're called hissing cockroaches because they've got holes all the way around the side of their body. And when they squish their body, out comes a hissing sound. That's to protect them from predators. My friends are so used to being around me, they're not going to hiss at all. And these animals are what we call decomposers. They eat anything and everything. Trash, food, poop, hair. Because of that, they will pass gas every 15 minutes. Do you know what that means? They fart every 15 minutes. And I see by the clock on the wall that it might just be safe. These animals will live two to five years or until somebody stands on them and in those two to five years, through all the generations, they will have 500,000 babies, half a million babies. At the San Diego Zoo, we always say, we're not gonna let another animal go extinct on our watch. With cockroaches, you don't have to worry. They're just fine. And those are my best friends, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Well, if you're going to have a best friend that isn't me, I suppose I'm okay with coming second to a hissing cockroach. Well, you know, Roberta, it's not just humans and cockroaches or zebras and birds. There's so many different interspecies relationships in the world. In fact, there's a word for it. It's called mutualism. That's where both species benefit from the relationship. In fact, I believe it's time for a round of trivia. Hello, my name is Dr. Myron Zoolittle, I'm Dr. Zoolittle's older brother, and I'm usually on sound, but they asked me to do the trivia because I am very good with mutualism and friendships. So, my first question for you is, which animal has a mutual relationship with a flower? Is it A, a sea star? Is it B, uh, an eagle? Or is it C, a bee? 
The answer is B. No, 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 not, not B, the eagle. It's C, the B. No, this is, this is so confusing. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't be doing this over here. Uh, let me start again. So which animal has a, a, a relationship with a flower? Is it A, a B, B, a B, or C, a B? The answer is B. Doesn't matter which one, just A, B, C, it's a B. So the B will get nectar from the flower and that nectar will help it make honey and the B will pollinate the flowers. Question number two. Is which animal has a relationship with a C and M? And M, and M, a C and M, a C and M. Roberta, can you help me say that word, please? Anemone. Okay, Roberta, if you could just say the word every time I get to the word C, that would be most helpful. Question number two: Which animal has a relationship with a C? Anemone. Is it A, a clownfish, B, a spider crab, or C? A black sea cucumber. The answer is A, the clownfish. You see, the clownfish is very territorial and protects the sea. An enemy. And the sea. An enemy. Is uh, got those long stinging tentacles, and that will protect the clownfish. <laughs> Okay, question number three. And Roberta, this one's for you. Which animal has a mutual relationship with a zebra? Is it A, a green tree boa, B, a zebrafish, or C, the oxpecker? The answer is the oxpecker. You see, the oxpecker will eat all the parasites and bugs from the zebra, and the oxpecker in return gets a delicious treat, a meal of all those parasites and bugs from the zebra. Good job, Roberta. I'm Myron, thank you. You know, Roberta, you should see if your friend likes to eat insects. Oh, Dr. Z, I would love to find out what my visitor likes to eat. If I could only get the opportunity to ask. Huh. Roberta, it's blank. I know exactly what this is. My siblings and I used to send secret messages using something called invisible ink. Hi, folks. Dr. Zulu here, and I'm here with... His assistant, Maisie. Fantastic. Invisible ink and the revealing solution. We're gonna teach you how to make both of those things. Now you really only need four ingredients. The first that you need is half a cup of H2O. Or water. Fantastic. And you're going to need a tablespoon of baking soda, baking soda. And then for the revealing solution, you're going to need half a cup of rubbing alcohol and... Yellow stuff. Yellow stuff or turmeric. Okay, so we're gonna start with the um, invisible ink, invisible ink. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put a tablespoon of baking soda into the water. We're gonna go ahead and stir that up, stir that up, stir that up, stir that up. Fantastic, all right. And then Macy, you're gonna take a paintbrush and you're going to paint something onto the paper. Go for it. Oh yeah, fantastic. There she goes. Oh, that's lovely, lovely. Okay, go ahead, keep going. All right, there we go. So um, she's written on there with the invisible ink. Now you have to let this dry. Fortunately, Maisie has already done this assignment and we have a couple of pages that she has already done. So if you look, you can't really see what these say. We're gonna put this down here and now we're gonna make the revealing solution. The revealing solution. We're gonna put... 
Fantastic. Into the rubbing alcohol. We're going to go ahead and mix that up, mix that up, mix that up. All right. Now, um, what you can use is a paper towel and dip that in and use it as a paintbrush. We are actually going to use a paintbrush today. Here we go, Maisie. Let's see what the sign says. Did it work? It worked! There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Maisie's secret invisible ink reveal. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, you were right, Dr. Z. It was written in invisible ink. Thanks to your brother, we were able to reveal this secret message. And it was from my little feathered friend. Would you like me to read it? Of course, Roberta. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, it says, <clears throat> Hi, Roberta. My name is Phoebe. I like to eat all kinds of insects, and sometimes I'll even snack on a very small fish. Thank you for letting me visit your habitat. I love perching on the trees. Your new friend, Phoebe. Oh, I want to write back, Dr. Z. I want to invite Phoebe around to visit. I don't know about fish, but there's always plenty of insects hanging out around here. Well, Roberta, why don't you send her a postcard and put your message on the back? Oh, yes, good idea. But I think I need some inspiration. I know who can help us. She always has some crafty tips for us. Take it away, Olivia. Today we're going to make a layered paper postcard. Now I've chosen the background to look a bit like Africa with the sunset and our baobab trees. So step number one is to grab the card that you want to be the background colour. And for me, that's going to be our red for the sunset. So you don't need to cut this one. Now the next layer is our orange. So all you need to do is to cut a little arch. Place that on your red to see how it looks. So far, so good. Glue it down. All right, next layer in our sunset is a slightly darker yellow. So same thing, we're going to cut an arch shape, but it's going to be smaller than our orange layer, so you can start to see those colours coming up. All right, our sunset's starting to look pretty good, but now we need our sun. So grab that extra yellow colour, and we're going to cut out a little bit down the bottom and a big bump for the sun, and a little bit over here, just like this. All right, now that we've got our perfect sunset, the next step is to create the silhouettes of our trees. Now, these ones are a little bit tricky, so if you need a bit of extra help, always ask an adult. Now, the first one we're going to do is our big, dark green tree. So you can either draw it first and then cut it out, or if you feel confident, you can just start cutting out freely. OK, there we have it, our first tree. So I like to stick mine to the left, and then when we create our smaller tree, we'll layer that on top as our final layer. All right, our green tree's looking pretty good. Now the next step is to cut out a smaller tree using our blue paper, which will be our final layer. How good does that look? I think that looks even better than our first one. With all those different coloured layers, you can make any kind of background that you like. to look just like my habitat. So Phoebe recognizes where it's from. I've asked her to stop by for an afternoon treat. Now, I just need to be a good host and prepare accordingly for my guests. How on earth am I gonna capture these for her? Berta, I would leave that up to Phoebe. I bet she is an expert at catching bugs. It's our human friends that I'm worried about. We need to find a snack for them. I doubt that they're going to enjoy eating bugs. Hmm, you're right. I don't really know much about human food. Is Olivia still around? Surely she can help us think of a way to make bugs edible. To 
Today, we're going to create caterpillars and snails using fruit and vegetables. And of course, using our peanut butter as glue, all on top of celery sticks. Now, step number one, we need to fill our celery stick with peanut butter. You can use a piping bag or you can place it in with a knife. Step number two, choose whatever fruit or vegetable you like to create the body of your caterpillar. I think I'm going to start with blueberries. And we'll leave this little spot at the front here for a head. Might do a grape. All right, now it's time to add our sugar eyes. Grab your peanut butter, put a little bit on and stick it on the front. And there we go. I think he looks pretty delicious. Now we might move on to make a snail. So same as before, grab your celery stick and put your peanut butter base in. Now we might make our head first actually, maybe a tomato. And of course, place our eyes. Now for a snail, of course, we need our snail shell. I'm thinking perhaps a bit of kiwi fruit will be perfect for this. Perfect, I think we'll add him to our collection. We have to make sure that we make enough for everyone. I think the next one will be another caterpillar. This time, I think we might use the red grapes. And maybe a blueberry head? It's looking pretty good. You know what's up next. Let's get those eyes. He might be my favourite one so far. And there you have it. Fruit and veggie, caterpillars and snails. Everything is ready for Phoebe's arrival. There's plenty of food here for every species to enjoy. I hope you all at home have got your edible bugs ready. Have you, Dr. Z? I could do a whole show just on the cooking segment. Oh, Roberta, it looks like your friend arrived. Oh, where? Where? Oh, hello, Phoebe. You know, it started off looking like a mystery but it ended up with Roberta making a new friend. That's right. Paige from the Baton Rouge Zoo helped me realize I'm not the only zoo animal to befriend a flying. And I got some great ideas for making Phoebe feel welcome from the Grizzly Buddies at Zoo Montana. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Roberta, don't forget. We also had the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. We made a postcard. Then we learned about invisible ink. And I love those edible bugs as well. And I'm so glad that my cockroaches weren't around to see us eating bugs. <laughs> Don't worry, Dr. Z. We'll keep that secret to ourselves. As long as you remember to bring a few extra crickets or mealworms along to share with Phoebe next time. You've got a deal, Roberta. And kids, remember, if you want to send us any jokes, stories, poems, questions, you need to send them to us at zmail at sandiegozoo.org. Z stands for Zebra and Zoo Little, mail at sandiegozoo.org. Get an adult to help you out, and if we use your story, your joke, your question, your poem, we'll mention your name as well. I am so excited you all joined us for today's episode, and I'm looking forward to our next visit, where we can do some more exploring and wondering about nature. Keep asking those questions. See you soon. Stay curious, my friends. Thank <laughs> you.